Welcome Cogs. So here's probably the most horrifying creation I've made to date. A fully 3D printed animatronic head with a lifelike silicone skin. I mentioned in my part 1 video that I'd been wanting to develop an accessible animatronic head that aims to have more degrees of freedom and ranges of motion than the current options, and while I definitely think I have some more work to do on this design, it's reached a point where it started making me uncomfortable, which is generally a pretty good sign of progress on this channel. This system I've developed for attaching the silicone skin at different points with magnetic panels has been quite the journey of failures and trial and error, so I want to show you guys my design process in this video and also talk about the workflow I'm developing for working on complex sculpted organic shapes in both CAD and Blender. My ultimate goal with all of my projects is to make them open source so that anyone can make them at home for free, but releasing several different versions of a design at various stages of being a work in progress has at times been a recipe for disaster, which is why I now offer all of my designs in an exportable, downloadable CAD or mesh format through Onshape here on my Patreon page. But once this design is robust, I will be throwing up the 3D printable STL files and code on my website for free. So contrary to how it's looking at the moment, my intention was to actually make this design a little less uncanny valley by exaggerating some of the proportions to be a little cartoonish and sort of not trying too hard to hide the fact that this is a robot. And so to make this easy to assemble, modify and test while also giving it a kind of sci-fi robot aesthetic, I made these magnetic panels to act as anchors to pin the silicone skin in place at the main interaction points of the mechanisms underneath. So this included two points per brow, which would give me access to kind of shocked, angry or sympathetic expressions with a pretty simple linear motion. The lips are more complex with two pairs of up and down linear motions for the main bulk of the lips than the mouth corners which work by coordinating motion between two pairs of motors letting me move anywhere on a plane perpendicular to these motors rotation axis. New in this version is a tongue which is pretty important in speech obviously and gives us a visual difference between how a T looks versus how an R looks. There's also attachment panels around the edges of the silicone skin, and this is what I meant about trying to draw attention to the fact that it's a robot. Rather than trying to disguise how the skin attaches, I went with a stylized panel design. So as you can imagine, with this project there was a pretty complex back and forth between a sculpting workflow and a CAD workflow in Onship, which took some figuring out. Here's a quick overview of the back and forth. I started with a royalty free head sculpture mesh that I found online, which I imported into Onship so that I could reference proportions. Then I built the vast majority of the mechanisms and structure in Onship, and then I brought this entire mechanism into Blender to sculpt the face so as to fit the mechanism right, converted this sculpted mesh into a CAD compatible IGES file, which I could then export into Onship, used the face surface design to cut out all of the panels and panel supports and thicken them, went back into Blender to boolean together all of the panel supports, and cut a relief of these shapes out of the initial sculpted mesh, and to quickly place all of the magnets and cut out relief for them. I could probably streamline this whole process, but some of this flip-flopping is necessary. I need to know what the mechanism will look like in order to design the face, and I need to have sculpted the face to design the panels back in CAD. So with the face designed, I moved on to the real challenge of this project, which was casting the face. The order of operations for how to make the mould is actually a real brain teaser. I really tied myself in knots trying to figure out the order I would need to do things, and I printed the mould enclosure and the face sanded it down and used clay to stick it face down in the bottom of the mould. So the shape I now made in clay would be the negative of the silicone I then poured into the top. And once I pulled out the top mould, cleaned off all the clay and recast the bottom half of the mould, I'd have what I originally modelled in clay now made out of silicone. I miscalculated how much silicone I needed so I ended up with half full moulds which I had to fill in with clay each time. I went with a very flexible silicone for the face, so I used mould release spray to ensure that I'd be able to get it out. I must have used the wrong type of mould release because the silicone never cured. I washed everything out, which was a huge, gross, sticky mess, and then tried again without mould release, with very accurate measurement of the two parts, with extremely thorough mixing, and tried with only one half of the mould using a slush casting technique to get an even layer, which is why I manually move the mould around to get an even curtain. And once again it didn't cure, and I didn't know why at that point in time, so I was pretty annoyed, especially because silicone is quite expensive. So if you follow me on Patreon, or you've been keeping an eye on the timeline of my videos, you'll notice that this first casting attempt was supposed to have succeeded and been a video released in September, but due to the setbacks I had to delay that video. 
When I look back on some of the videos I made during lockdown or during university, I sometimes feel like there was a certain attention to detail and polish that came with having more time and less responsibility and a drive to finish projects and document them comprehensively that maybe I'm less in touch with now that my main source of income is the content I produce. Now I live to make cool projects. I want to make the best, most realistic eye mechanism you've ever seen. I want to make a bionic hand that's better than my real hand. I want to design mechanical masterpieces and give them to the world for free and see you guys as pictures and videos and variations and remixes and inspire the next generation. I don't ever want to half-bake or rush projects to make content. And lately I've been thinking of another way to make my projects more complete and shift that balance and make them more polished and accessible. And that idea is to offer some of the more bespoke components and parts for you guys to buy. Here I have the very first Will Cogley designed eyeball manufactured externally using an industrial mold maker which can be made in the thousands and distributed to you guys if that's something that you're interested in. I want to get you guys' opinions, so in the description you'll find a Google form which you can use to tell me what kind of parts you have trouble getting and what you might want to buy from me. Maybe you'd want to buy a circuit board which is plug-in and play with the entire project preloaded onto it. Maybe you want a source of small servers other than Amazon that you know are fit for purpose. Let me know your thoughts. So after my Halloween project, I returned to this one with renewed enthusiasm to get this mold right. I abandoned my blender mold shell and flip-flopped one final time back into one shape to design a much more robust mold. I decided this time to only cast one side of the mold since the back of the face could be a little rougher using a 3D printed surface only and I designed in every registration feature so it would be ready to go with minimal effort. It also meant that I didn't have to use any clay which was super messy and since I didn't know for sure what was inhibiting the curing of the silicone I wanted to rule out other clay. I made the same mistake though by not mixing enough silicone for the full mold but thankfully I was able to buy some more and fill it up with a second pour to complete the design the following day. Which was actually very annoying to do since I had to carefully pour down one of the narrow gaps, but it did fix the mould. Side note, I don't have a vacuum degassing chamber, so my Theragun made a pretty good agitator to get some of the bubbles out. Then I had to actually get the mould out, which was kind of a nightmare since I used silk PLA which tends to be kind of brittle, so the mould started breaking up as I arrived on it and I eventually ended up having to saw the whole thing in half, destroying both rigid halves of the mould. Thankfully the actual silicone part of the mould was perfectly preserved and I was able to reprint the shells to complete the mould. I used a tiny 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 spray of mould release because I didn't want that to inhibit the curing poured in my Ecoflex silicone and thank god it worked out this time. I think the main reason it worked is actually probably just because I had originally used too much mould release for such a thin pour, or maybe it was some chemical in the clay I used, but having a better designed mould with air holes, overflow channels and registration features did make a huge difference and for that I have to thank the sponsor of this video, Onship for making such a flexible CAD application that allowed me to throw all of this data into the cloud, super high poly meshes and complex surfaces, and I was able to pretty easily and quickly make a mold that saved this project. In addition, of course, to the entire rest of the head mechanism, which was also designed in Onshape. There are a lot of CAD packages out there, but what Onshape has that I haven't seen in anything else is the online sharing and collaboration features. After all, this is what has allowed me to give my patrons access to my perpetually up-to-date CAD files in my online workspace. But the other features it has, like branching and merging designs just like you would for a GitHub design, makes it unbeatable for me. Onshape has totally changed my design workflow. Whereas before I would pretty much design everything in situ, I now have a library of standard parts and I make separate documents and part studios for progressively bigger groups of parts. Onshape makes this possible because I can have designs which reference other online documents and any changes I make to, for example, my part studio for the body and exclusion zone of a standard servo will be reflected in my subassembly across multiple designs if I want and the interface makes this super easy to manage. Check out my Patreon to get access to the newest version of all my CAD files that I have at any point in time on Onshape and using the link below at onshape.pro forward slash Will you can get a free hobbyist license and on the same link companies and engineers can trial the professional plan free for 6 months. Now although I left a lot of weight 
on top of the mould, it did somehow come out a little thicker than it should have, which ended up being quite a pain because the magnets weren't strong enough to reliably hold the panels in place at that thickness. So there was quite a time consuming process to strip down the silicone at the attachment points with a razor blade. And because this was so fiddly, I did slip a few times and made a few holes. It would probably have made more sense to recast the face honestly, but sometimes I prefer to try and find all of the potential issues that I'm going to run into rather than fixing each one as soon as it pops up, because sometimes you'll find a different kind of problem that completely changes the way you think about the first problem you found, and you wouldn't have had to waste that time fixing the first problem if you knew about the second problem. In this case, I did think of a much better way to approach making the skin, and so for the time being I rolled with this version, despite having a few issues with holes and bubbles. Another anticipated problem I had was fitting the magnets into the panels and panel supports. It was so much of a pain that I didn't even record myself doing it because it was so messy and frustrating, but in case you didn't know, magnets actually stick together and they do not like sitting still together in close proximity with each other, and super glue also sticks your fingers together, so I had pretty much a full day of fighting with magnets and glue to get them all in. I don't think I would have been able to do it without using a little spray bottle of water to activate the super glue. I use a thick, slow drying and high build super glue with a squirt of water to speed up the setting and the bond it makes is pretty great. I then pinned down the face using all of my panels. The adhesion was still a little weak though so I added an extra intermediary magnet which really helped. I guess because it allowed the small magnet to sink further into the silicone whereas the magnets inside the panels kind of restricted it and spread the force out over a larger area meaning that it couldn't really compress that silicone. In my last video I mentioned how I used a circuit board manufactured by JLC PCB for the eye mechanism, which was effectively an Arduino Nano clone embedded onto a power conversion circuit and servo breakout. For the rest of the head I decided to go with something a little simpler, for now since the head overall is at a fairly early stage of development compared to my animatronic eyes. So I designed an Arduino shield which would allow me to use an Arduino Mega to control all of the servos using the PWM pins and also provide both 12 volt power to the Arduino and regulated 6 volt power to the servos. It did this using two linear regulators to give me the high current that I would need. I want to thank JLC PCB for providing me with these excellent quality boards. I'm a big fan of their service and I recently met up with them at a trade show in Munich with some other YouTubers and we did a little interview talking about some of my projects and design process so look out for that video on JLC PCB's YouTube channel when it gets published. I also have been using Easy EDA recently to design my boards which allows me to make designs very quickly since they already have JLC PCB's stock data including their footprints and data sheets and speed is something I really value as someone who makes a lot of these quick prototypes. A big thank you to JLC PCB, I really would recommend checking them out, they provide an excellent service and they're really fun at trade shows too. So mechanically I do feel like I'm a lot closer now, the corners of the cheeks aren't really pulling back as far as I'd like, but other than that I'm pretty satisfied. Clearly the main area for development is the skin. I think the panel idea has a lot of merit. But having all of these components isn't really ideal because they're easy to lose and the magnets aren't very strong and trimming down the skin left it so thin that you can see through it and it's very easy to tear too. I actually had a much better idea of how to do this using the same panels but this time actually casting them to be inside of the face with a two part mould. Firstly I would use slush casting to make a thin outer layer and then put all of the panels into position and use either the other half of the mould or another round of slush casting to seal them in. I think this would first and foremost just stick a lot better, but I also think it would look much better because although you'd be able to kind of see the panels through the skin a little bit, the whole surface would look much more congruent and intentional rather than these panels that kind of oddly stick out and draw attention to themselves. I also think that once I do this and the design functions better and looks more realistic, I'll have new ideas for how to improve the realism. One thing which I have considered is how different thicknesses in different positions will make the skin move in different ways, and so at a later date when I perfected my mould making techniques, I'd love to try a face design with variable thickness so parts like the cheeks and forehead would be thicker to restrict motion and the eyelids would be much thinner. I'd also like to put a lot more work into the electronics. I like that I've decoupled the eye mechanism from the rest of the head because it makes it modular, but I would like to have a better interface between the two and a more fit for purpose board with more organised inputs to streamline the whole thing. 
So thanks for watching guys and a huge thank you to my patrons who are making this all possible for me right now and I'll see you all in the next video.